So, just going to, for a little bit of context here, we know that uh, Paul writes the letter to the, the Galatian church, and it's because there are people come into the church who are trying to take them away from the, the good news, the gospel, that Paul preached to them, that all they required was faith, to have faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour for them to become believers. And these people were coming in, and in fairness to them, these people, they had been brought up in Judaism, whereby they were living under a law given by God to the people of Israel. And the law was given to Israel for many reasons. Uh, some of the reasons was to show them as a separate people uh, that was set apart for God, and they were to tell the world about God. And they had all different rules and regulations. But one of the things about the law was that the people were to realize that it was impossible to actually fulfill the law. The law was the requirement for us to be reconciled to God. And the law showed that to be reconciled to God, you had to be perfect. Perfect in every way, in word, in thought, in deed. Right. Have, you ever, have you ever had a boss I had the displeasure of having a boss one time who, who wanted to get rid of me. And when my contract was drawn up, you're given a list of things, what you're expected to do, right? And they're always quite, sort of, how's the word? They're open to interpretation. And when he wanted to get rid of me, he started to work me harder and harder. And I didn't really have any course of uh, appeal because the contract was there and it could be interpreted in many different ways. And what I realized was it was impossible to please this boss. I was never going to please him. For whatever reason, after two or three years, I wasn't the person for, for him. And, um, and that, that was one of those things. Now, what we see in the law that Israel had was that the law was supposed to show them perfection was required to get back to God they couldn't do it. So the only way they could do it to get to God was by faith. Faith in God and faith in the Messiah yet to come. So the Apostle Paul who's written this book to the Galatians, he starts to outline to the Galatians who he was, i.e. his his apostolic ministry, in other words, his, his credentials for giving them the gospel of grace and not the gospel of law, his credentials came from Jesus himself. From Jesus himself. He went to the church in Jerusalem and then later he, and he, he, taught, he showed them the gospel of grace, it was accepted. He then at a later point went to Antioch where Peter was and Peter and other disciples had separated themselves from the people who had not been Jews and come, become Christians, i.e. Jewish Christians, and the people who were non-Jews, the Gentiles who had become Christians. He separated himself from them and that was wrong and, and Peter knew it was wrong. So th when we get through Galatians 1 and into 2, Paul really takes Peter to task. And here he is defending the gospel of grace. So I'm going to pick it up in, uh, let's see, chapter 2. And I think it's worthwhile. I'll start at verse 11, chapter 2. So this is him talking about when he went to, when Peter came to Antioch, right? When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, this is the ones who wanted to tell the Gentiles they had to become Jews first, then they could become Christians. Okay, 
Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentile Christians, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So circumcision was the sign for Jewish men who were God's people. Under the law, they had to be circumcised. So it was a physical sign in their body that they were dedicated to God. And these people who wanted to change the gospel of grace that Paul was teaching, that it was faith and faith alone in Christ, the first thing they wanted to happen was that they had to be circumcised. So let's start with circumcision. You go, <laughs> oh, ouch, you know. So, um, the, so this was, they called them the circumcision group. Paul uh, na named them that. The other Jews joined in Peter's hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. And Barnabas was one of Paul's closest friends. So Paul must have been really upset because as though everybody had turned against the gospel that he, was, he had given to them and that they had received and fully accepted. And also Peter and the other disciples had accepted it. But now a pressure group was coming in and wanting them to change that. So these were quite, uh, how should we say, these were quite a strong force and Paul had to be very firm with them. So when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, this is verse 14, I said to Peter in front of them all, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified. Justification, justification means that legally your sins are wiped out gone. Sins past, present and future. God pronounces you innocent, innocent from those sins. That's what justification is. And a simple way to, simple mnemonic is justification, just as if I had never sinned. So that's a good, a good way to remember. So you know that a man is not justified by ob 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 obeying the, the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law because by observing the law, no one can be justified. It's impossible to fulfill the law. So you can't have your sins wiped out by following the law. So Paul at some point started to recognize this. So he goes on, if we seek to be justified by Christ, it becomes uh, evident that we, ourselves, and that we ourselves are sinners. Does that mean that Christ promotes sin? So what he's saying is that God says your sins have been wiped out, wiped clean, legally you have no sin. Well, hang on, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. Do I still sin? Yes, I do. James tells us, if we say we are without sin, we make Jesus out to be a liar. Justification is a legal thing, right? Learning to live a life in Christ is a progressive thing, and that is called sanctification, okay? So they were saying, what, the, what these people were saying uh, to Paul was, hang on, you say that you've been justified before God, and yet you're still sinning. So you make Christ out, Christ out uh, that Christ promotes sin. Paul says, absolutely not. If I re rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. So what he's talking about here, if he rebuilds what he's destroyed, Paul came out from under the law, died to the law and said, no more the law. If he tries to rebuild it by going back to the law, it says, I'm a lawbreaker, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. And the verses I want to concentrate on now is verses 19, 20, and 21. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Well, that's, that's a big statement. 
I, Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The, li the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for its righteousness could be gained. Uh, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So, we're going to look at this whole uh, situation about what Paul says, being crucified with Christ. Okay. There's several places in the Bible that speak of being crucified with Christ or having died with Christ. For example, Colossians. If you've got your Bibles, just uh, turn to these. Colossians 2.20. Uh, there we go. Colossians 2.20 Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such reg reg uh, regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Romans 6, 3-14 I'll start at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means we die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Do you remember when we had the baptisms the other week? It symbolises us going down to the grave and dying to our old sinful na nature and being raised from the grave into a new life. So if we have been united with him like this in death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to be uh, to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. 
So we have been literally put on a cross and crucified with Christ. The phrase crucified with Christ is symbolic of a spiritual truth. So it's symbolic of a spiritual truth. The key passage, as we were reading before, is in Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the context of Galatians is two, uh, Galatians 2 is how the believer is made right with God. False teachers were telling the Galatian churches that faith in Christ was not enough. To be saved, they said, believers must also be circumcised and uh, become Jewish. Only then would they be put right with God. We can have that today within the Christian church all over the Western nations. We can have people who will say to us, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. How could you be a Christian and do this and how can you be a Christian and do that? But what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says to be a Christian, you have only got to believe, have faith in Christ that he was Jesus, that he died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, and is seated at the right hand of his Father. All you've got to do is have faith in that. Believe Jesus is who he says he was, and that he did what the Bible tells us he did for the reasons he did it. That's it. How your life progresses after that is a different matter. Okay, so... I'm just going to give a couple of definitions, okay? I'm always aware that we use words, and I sit in church sometimes, and the, the pastor, the preacher, they'll use a word, and I think, I think I know what it means. I've got a good idea what it means. But actually, when I look at it closer, I don't really know what it means. So we've used the word justification, and there's this other word I use, is sanctification. So Paul's talking about us reckoning ourselves dead because we've been crucified, on the, identifying totally with Jesus. He paid for our sins. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus. It was the only way that the sinfulness of mankind could be dealt with and that mankind had the opportunity to be reconciled to God, to have peace with God. The only way we can have peace with God is to have our sins dealt with. It was the only way. And if you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his crucifixion, he asked his Father if it were possible that he wouldn't have to go there. That he wouldn't have to go to the cross because he was a hundred percent man and a hundred percent God. He knew the suffering that he was going to go through. But he also knew that for the first time in his life he would experience the effect of sin in his life. Remember that when he cried out on the, the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that point, the sin of the whole world was poured out onto Jesus. And it was God's wrath to deal with that sin God wouldn't be just if he allowed sin to go unpunished. But because he loves us so much, he came up with a plan. And that plan was that his son 
would come to the earth, that God would become a man and live a sinless life on the earth. He's the only man that's ever walked the face of the earth and did not sin. And that was what was required was the death of a sinless man taking on all of the sin of the world to pay for our sin. And why did he do it? He said it, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him would have eternal life. Do you believe in him? Do you trust him? All you've got to do is believe in him and trust him. So I'm just going to give a, a, a little uh, definition of sanctification and justification. Both justification and sanctification are God's gracious gifts, either gifts that we don't deserve, received by faith. But there are also three important differences. Number one, justification is legal. Sanctification is transformational. Okay? When I accepted Christ as my saviour, instantly I was justified. It didn't mean that I stopped sinning. It meant that my sin was paid for and God didn't account it against me, didn't count it against me. So justification is the opposite of condemnation. It's a change in status from being guilty before God to being called righteous, holy or perfect. I'll read that again. It's a change in the status from being a guilty sinner before God to being called righteous, holy, and perfect. Justification is God's legal declaration that a person is both innocent of all charges made against them and immune, this is brilliant, this, immune from any future charge in God's court of law. You can't come back at a later point once you've been justified by God. He's not going to come back at a later point and hold those sins against you. It's both forgiveness and legal immunity so that the person is unable to become guilty. This works because by faith a person embraces Jesus as the legal representative before God. And as the work of the legal representative, Jesus' work counts as their own. What was Jesus' work? He went to the cross. Jesus' work counts as their own, and Jesus' death counts as their own. To explain further in justification, Jesus' status is applied to a person by faith. By faith in Christ, Jesus' status is applied to a person by faith. Unlike justification, sanctification is transformational. Sanctification isn't a change in status, but an actual change in our human condition. Justification is being declared forgiven and righteous, but sanctification is being made righteous and holy. So the day that we become a believer, we're justified, declared innocent, past, present and future, then starts the work. Not work of obeying the law, a new way of living, right? Justifica justification happens all at once. Sanctification happens over your lifetime after you become a believer. So you will continue to be in this process of being sanctified. What you want to do is become more like Jesus, right? 
As a change in status, justification is immediate, final and complete. A person doesn't become justified over time and a person doesn't become more or less justified throughout their life. For Christians, justification is an event in God's court of law that has already happened. This is why Paul described a Christian as having been justified in the same way that Christ died once for all. Jesus' work is the grounds for justification and Jesus' life is the pattern for sanctification. So we get our sins forgiven, you become a new, a new person, and by faith a person embraces Jesus as their legal representative before God. One of the, one of the passages in the Bible says that, that Jesus sits at the right hand of God interceding for us as our legal representative, the devil goes in and says, have you seen Neil Hardy? Have you seen what he said? Have you seen him, the way he was shouting at that person that was reversing out the side street in front of him in his car? And he lost his temper and he was, he was in a hurry. And Jesus said, he's declared righteous. What I did on the cross for him, he is righteous. So by faith a person embraces Jesus as the legal representative before God, meaning that Christ's work counts as their own and Christ's death counts as their own. This works because Jesus as the Messiah came to fulfill all of God's requirements for eternal life as a representative of humanity. Through the resurrection, Jesus enters into, eternal, enters into the eternal life that he has secured for everyone who trusts him for salvation. In sanctification, Jesus' life is a pattern to follow. In sanctification, God transforms his people over a time period to resemble Jesus. Conclusion. Sanctification is God's beautiful transforming work in the life of its people is the transforming presence and power of the Holy Spirit and offered as a gift to anyone who desires it. So sanctification and justification, two different things. So let's get back to our passage in Galatians 2.20. So Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live, live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Galatians 2 is how the believer is made right with God. False teachers were telling them they needed to become Jewish before they could become believers. In Galatians 2, 15 to 16, Paul rejects that idea completely. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of the law by the works of the law no one will be justified so through the law to Galatians 19 through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God well while Paul was trying to please God by keeping the law he was not really living for God. When we see Paul's character, this is one of the things that come up in my mind when I, when I started doing this study. When we see Paul's character, Paul always wanted to do the right thing. He wanted to please God. He knew the law inside out. He knew it off by heart. So, when he was lying in his bed at night, those things that he knew broke God's law, they must have come up in his mind. He must have known. He must have known. The more he tried to keep the law, the more he saw how much he failed. You could say that the law killed Peter. When Jesus confronted him 
on the on the road. He said to him, Why why are you persecuting me, Paul? Paul recognized straight away that it was the Lord. He then at some point went to be with Jesus and Jesus personally taught him about being saved by grace. He would have understood then Jesus' teaching about the law from the Sermon on, from the, sermon on the Mount. When, when Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount, he showed the people about the law, how it was impossible to keep the law. For instance, it says, you know, the law says, do not commit adultery. Right? Don't commit adultery. But Jesus says, if you look upon a woman, so if you address it to the men, he never said anything about the women, I must admit that. <laughs> he addressed it to the men, if you look upon a woman with lustful thoughts, you have already committed adultery in your heart. And it says, don't murder. Have you ever thought of someone that you really, really hated for something they've done? He says, if you hate somebody, it's the same as having actually committed the murder. It's spiritual. I, I think <laughs> it must have been for Paul when Jesus taught him this. It must have been like that aha moment in his life. All his life, he'd been trying to keep the law. All his life, he probably, it doesn't tell us this in the script, he probably knew that it was impossible. And then Jesus told him the truth. It's by faith in me alone. It's by grace. It's not by the law. The law was your schoolmaster to point you to me. The law was telling you, it's impossible to be perfect. The only way you can come to God is through me, having faith in me, I will deal with all of your sins, all of your law breaking, I will deal with it. It must have been Paul's aha moment. It showed him that he could never live up to the law and fulfill its holy standard. He realized that the law made him guilty before God, not justified before God. So it was this sense of guilt that killed Paul, killed him to the law. Paul, Paul, and made him see that trying to keep the law, that wasn't the answer. It showed him it was only when he gave up trying to achieve righteousness by his own and accepted the righteousness of God by faith in Christ that he truly began living for God, i.e. justification by faith been put right with God by accepting Christ's sacrifice by faith. And that's what actually makes it possible to live for God. Being crucified with Christ means that we no longer, uh, means that we are no longer under the penalty of the law. That penalty was paid by Christ on our behalf. And when Christ was crucified, it was as if we were crucified with him. We need to understand that when we accept Jesus as our saviour, we identify with him. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He gives the Holy Spirit to us to help us with that process with that sanctification when Christ was crucified it was as if we were crucified with him the penalty was fully paid just as surely as if we had been crucified for our own sins when Christ rose from the dead we rose too now the risen Christ empowers us to live for him in a way that pleases God we used to seek life through our own works, but now we live by faith in the Son of God. Being crucified with Christ means that we are new creations. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Let's just turn to 2 Corinthians and see that verse. 
2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. So for now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we were once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We know a song about that. I am a new creation. And see, Paul says there's now no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone. The old life is dead and gone. We walk in the newness of life. That's us positionally. We become new, right? But we still have this struggle. <laughs> Being crucified with Christ means that we have a new way of life. At one time we followed the ways of this world and, and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. But that way of life was nailed to the cross. Now we follow Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, with the help and the leading of his Holy Spirit. With his Holy Spirit we can seek to please him. So he didn't just abandon us and say, your sins are forgiven, you're perfect now. No, make sure you don't sin. He gives us his word to show us how to live, but he gives us his Holy Spirit to give us the power to enable us. God also prepares things for us. He gives us opportunities for good works good things to do and um, I've always had a problem with uh, what's the word with helping people who have got difficulties Is that, I, don't, I don't know who are struggling maybe physically and mentally and I just have never known how to relate to them and recently about a year maybe more than a year ago a chap at our church fallen into bad times and uh, all over the place and physically is really struggling to walk and and I use the expression that me and Anne get roped into helping them and I'll be honest at first I resented it I really did I resented it but we only go once a week to see him and other times sometimes we take him to places to appointments or something like that but I resented it and I said to God God you've got to change my heart I knew that this was wrong to feel this way you've got to change my heart Lord and and I, I think there's a phrase that's come into my life a number of times when I've had really hard times and I've said God I can't do this I can't do it and I remember one night I was really struggling with that boss I was telling you about who I could never please him and I remember on my face in the bedroom saying God I can't do this and I just lay still and it was almost as though I heard his still small voice saying you're right I agree with you Neil you can't do this but I can do it th you, you can do it through me so he said that I could do these things through Christ who strengthens me through the power of his Holy Spirit in my life so we are new creations. That's the something that this concept, we've got to take that on. That is declared we are new creations in Christ. We have been forgiven of all our sins, past, present and future. The old is gone, the new is here. The old life is dead and gone and we walk in the newness of life. Being crucified with Christ means that we have a new way of life. So we need his Holy Spirit we need to seek him, read his word. The idea of being crucified with Christ emphasizes our union with him, his death on our behalf. We trust in Christ's crucifixion as a payment for our, penal, uh, for our sin penalty. I'll say that again. We trust in Christ's crucifixion as payment for our sin. The penalty for our sin was death. 
and we rely on his power to live in a way that pleases God. The emphasis is not on what... Uh, sorry, I've, I've lost this a little bit. Uh, Right, the, so I'll just, my glasses are steaming up a bit. The emphasis is on what he has done for us, not what we have done for him. He's done everything for us. We have done nothing to deserve anything. Too often, people fall into the trap of saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is Christ who, li who lives in me. That then changes a little bit and said, I need to crucify my sinful desires and try harder to live for God. When this becomes our perspective, we have slipped out of living by grace and back into living under the law. And we minimize the power of Christ's death for us. We are relying less upon the power of Christ and more upon our own power. And that will never work out well. This is one of the hardest concepts to get over in our minds. I tried to give maybe a poor example there where my sinful thoughts was, I, I didn't sign up for this, I didn't sign up for this. And yet God changed my heart because I knew it was wrong. His Holy Spirit was saying to me, your attitude is wrong. So what did I, how, what was I got to do? How could I change my attitude? What was I got to do? I will not feel this, I will not feel this, I won't, I won't feel like this. I will be better, I will be a good person, I will enjoy it. No, I said, God, you've got to help me. And he took me at my word. And by his Holy Spirit, he changed my heart. He softened my heart. And now I actually enjoy going and helping that guy. Enjoy, we take him out on a Friday when the weather's good up to the park and he takes them about 30 minutes just to walk our little circuit of the park, get my coffee. It's not a lot, it's not a lot. There's many, many people in the world do far, far more for, for people. God changes hearts. In short, Galatians 20, 20 tells us how we escape, escape the penalty of sin to live a life that pleases God, knowing that we are crucified with Christ should give us great encouragement in our Christian walk. We have the power to say no to sin and yes to God. Because we're new creations, because of God's, because of God's Holy Spirit living in, in us, we can say no to sin. So when something comes into our life and we know it is wrong, His Holy Spirit a lot of times we'll just know by his word, they'll say, mm, don't have anything to do with that. We'll keep away from that. Other times it might be a little bit doubtful. His Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and you say to him, Lord, is it right that I should be doing this? Or do I have freedom in you to do this? These are things that we have got to work out between us and God and his, his word. Does that make sense? It's, these are hard concepts, but the, the, the one that I was really struggling with is, I've known this for years, that the Bible says that we have been crucified with Christ. And I thought, how does that work? Our sins have been nailed to the cross. How does that work? And it's our identification. We accept him by faith. He, by his Holy Spirit, comes to dwell within us. We are part of his body, the body of Christ, it's called. So we actually share in his death. And our sins have been dealt with. I hope that makes sense. So back to Galatians and finish off in the... Verse 21, so that was verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, 
For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So Paul shows why the issue of law and righteousness is so important. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. When he says, I do not set aside the grace of God, Paul concluded his public confrontation with Peter with strength. For these Jewish Christians from Jerusalem require uh, to require for themselves or anyone else to live under the law of Moses to be right with God was to set aside the grace of God, the very thing Paul does not do. You see, to nullify grace would be to put one's trust not in salvation as God's free gift, but in one's own efforts. To do this is to reject grace altogether and relying on one's effort means that one nullifies that grace. If righteousness comes through the law, if this proposition is true, then Jesus died in vain. Because you can be righteous before God by law keeping. If you can be righteous before God by law keeping, you don't need the work of Jesus to make you righteous. So Paul was saying, you can't, you can't do that. You can't mix these two things together. You can't have living by grace and faith in Christ and Christ alone and adding to it, adding to it a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You can see why Paul was angry. Because what they were basically saying was, Jesus, what you did on the cross wasn't good enough. It wasn't complete, it wasn't good enough. What did he say on the cross? I've forgotten that. <laughs> it is finished. So what they were doing was saying, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do this, you've got to be circumcised and all that. No. What they were saying to Jesus was, your death, your sacrifice on the cross was not good enough. We're going to add to it. So just to remind you what happened in the garden in Matthew 26, Jesus' prayer in the garden, he asked if there could be any other way to accomplish what stood before him at the cross and he asked to be spared the cross. But he was not spared the cross because there is no other way to accomplish what he did. This is also the great problem with seeing the grace of God as something that helps us to get to heaven as if we put forth the best we can and then grace supplies the rest. No, grace isn't just part of our way to get to heaven. Grace doesn't help us get to heaven. It does it all. Nothing else helps us to get to heaven except that Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures. And I heard an old preacher say that right at the very end of his preaching. He says, uh, Christ died for my sins according to the scriptures and I expect to swing out into eternity on that. that alone. All of our righteousness comes from the work of Jesus for us. Not by any works that we can do. He provides his Holy Spirit to help us, to be our helper in everything that we do, to empower us. And why did he do it? Because God so loved the world that he gave Christ, his only begotten son, and if you add into it, 
he accepted the task. He completed the task. That whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray.